today we have the great pleasure to have a talk with Laurent Brochard, a professor at the University of Toronto and well-known specialist in uh, all aspects of respiratory failure. We are together at a meeting on this topic at the Mayo Clinic. That's the reason why Laurent has a tie on like everybody at the Mayo Clinic. Hello, Laurent. Welcome. Uh, Thank you very much, Jean-Louis. I'm very pleased to, to chat with you, uh, even Good. if uh, we could be and in person, but that's that's very great. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and we, we could actually discuss many aspects of uh, acute respiratory failure, but one of your favorite aspects is the non-invasive respiratory support. And indeed, you published some very nice studies on this in the New England Journal and other journals on actually the uh, survival benefit of uh, non-invasive uh, support. So let, let, let's have a, uh, an update on this and we will see how COVID-19 maybe uh, helped us to improve our understanding of uh, these various systems. So uh, perhaps we could start with, uh, with, with high flow oxygen. We use it more and more, don't we, Laurent? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we when we discuss today, uh, we have in mind also the COVID pandemic because it has been used a lot during the COVID pandemic. I think it's a, it's an interesting technique. We don't understand completely how it works, but one of the findings we, we made was that uh, this is a technique which also, you know, it wash out the dead space, the CO2, uh, but it also increases the resistance to breathing. So usually we think it's bad, but in fact, it may be the reason why the frequency decreases because you you expire against a resistance and that may explain also some benefit in lung injury. You, you maintain the lung volume longer. And in, yeah. in, uh, in, in uh, before COVID, we had some strong data from uh, the Florali study, but also... Uh, Yep. You know, the, the guidelines say it should be the first line treatment in acute respiratory failure. And we had also positive uh, studies during uh, COVID. So I think it's an interesting first line technique, well tolerated. And uh, yeah, the and patients usually be... like it quite, quite, quite much. Now, it also provides a little bit of CPAP, of course. Yeah. So the CPAP effect is th this is where it's a bit strange because it's not very high. It's yeah. maybe five, six, seven centimeters of water when the mouth is closed. Yeah. But many many patients keep their mouth open, so yeah. the pressure should be minimal. Yeah. Uh, and it may be this resistive effect which explains that it still uh, uh, has an effect on, on lung volume. So high flow versus CPAP then, how will we choose between the two? Yeah, so CPAP has different effects, some on the lung, some on the diaphragm. Uh, I, I, I and think, some of the heart. Uh, CPAP uh, may uh, improve oxygenation. That does not mean it will prevent uh, intubation. So I would still be careful with CPAP, even if there is a, a, a randomized study in uh, COVID. In, uh, in COVID patients. And there were CPAP has been really very successful, especially in uh, in postoperative complications because. What you need at that time is pressure, right? To, to try yeah. to yeah. reopen the atelectasis. So yeah. CPAP could be a way. Um, you, you should very quickly see if it's well tolerated. And in, in that regard, maybe the, the helmet device, maybe- uh, well, uh, well, let, to... Let's first speak about the non-invasive ventilation. So yeah. uh, if it's not too well tolerated, perhaps we could add a little bit of pressure support to it uh, yeah. using non-invasive ventilation. What do you think? Yes, yeah, that's that's true. So if you put a mask for the CPAP, I would say, why not putting directly non-invasive ventilation with, with some pressure support ventilation? You um, always use pressure support, not volume predetermined. Yeah, we use pressure support or pressure control because uh, with yep. pressure control, you don't have the problem with the leaks at the end of the inspiration. It will cycle uh, exactly if you do uh, an inspiratory time of one second or 0.8 seconds, that should be okay. And uh, also, both in the Florali study and in, in the study we did with Guillaume Carteau in, in Créteil, 
we found that patients who fail non-invasive ventilation uh, have a very high tidal volume. So yeah. I think if you use a NIV um, machine with the monitoring of the expired tidal volume, and if you see the tidal volume is close to nine or 10 ml per kilogram, this is a strong indicator that the patient is going to fail and probably uh, should not wait too long before going to intubation. Okay, now let's go to helmet. Indeed, it was initially proposed by our Italian colleagues, and then it expanded in uh, in Europe. But the North Americans appear to discover it. Maybe not in Canada, but at least in the U.S., they appear to discover it. So, what do you think? Yeah, we we do have it also in in Canada, and it was a matter of distribution, right? It was not distributed, uh, <laughs> so not available. Um, I I. I wonder, I think this uh, helmet may also have the, the same effect than the high flow with a, uh, an expiration, which is against some, some pressure, some resistance, so which maintain the lung volume better. Because there are some surprising effect that if, if you have the same setting than with a mask NIV, you have better result with the helmet, better uh, uh, effect on lung volume. So, um, I think it's an interesting technique. I, I wouldn't say it's it will be the magical bullet no. for everything. Yeah. But uh, if- And uh, usually the patients like it, although initially uh, may, they may be a little bit claustrophobic when they have the helmet yeah. around the head, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, no. do, do you, yeah, please. Well, one do thing you, we, you have to be careful is that uh, it does not work with every ventilator or every setting. So, so you have to be careful, for instance. Uh, That's what I was about to say. Yeah. yeah and what, yeah. what about CPAP versus non invasive ventilation? Uh, it's primarily for CPAP, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I think if you have a ventilator which works with the helmet, and I, I personally add uh, uh, some, uh, some level of pressure support, not very high, but. Uh, yeah, not very high. I think you can deliver PEEP well and, and then add some pressure support. The, the monitoring of the tidal volume is lost during when when you use the helmet. So that's a bit uh, a small mm -hmm. disadvantage. It's it's purely clinical monitoring. Yeah, right. What what will be the future? Do you think we'll have some other systems to propose? Yeah, I think um, I think uh, continuing on the high flow yeah. associated with with non-invasive ventilation, maybe something. Uh, uh, if we understand well the mechanism of high flow, the pressure generated, the resistance, it could be added to another non-invasive ventilation technique, and and that could be a future. What what we have seen with COVID, we we discussed that quickly, yeah. um, is that uh, many techniques have been successful to prevent intubation, right? right? Uh, right. CPAP, high flow, helmet. Uh, so yeah. usually it was not with a difference in, in survival, but that's okay, right? Because if the patient survived without being intubated, it, it's, it's probably beneficial. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So there are many yeah. techniques available. Uh, well, uh, several I techniques, think, let's say, yeah. But yeah. Could, we, could we personalize our approaches then and ask the, the patient what he or she prefers? Absolutely, that's a very good point. And, uh, and in fact, uh, you mentioned the helmet, for instance, some patients will, will be afraid. So you have to be yeah. very careful when you start and explain. There is this, uh, this you know, opening of the helmet to, to, to tell the patient, uh, if, you, if you are afraid, you can open it uh, immediately. Um, yeah, right, right. But, Good point. Yeah. Good point, yeah. Reassurance is, is really very important. Oh, very, very important. And people and, uh, remaining at the bedside, nurse yeah. or physiotherapist yeah. or doctor remaining at the bedside for a while, that's important. Now, yeah. when to give up? When uh, to say, well, let's let's go and, uh, and intubate yeah. the trachea? Perhaps just before that, for how long could we use it? The, the high flow oxygen, we can use it for quite long periods of time, but what about CPAP, non-invasive ventilation? If the patient is on, on this type of systems for hours and hours, what do you think? Yeah, so, so just to mention that uh, several, uh, um, there are several reports or studies or, 
or RCTs, which use the combination of uh, non-invasive ventilation and high flow. So when you, you stop the yeah. NIV, which, which, yeah. which may not be tolerated for very long periods, you can, you can transfer to, uh, to high flow. And that's, uh, I think, a, a very logical approach. Uh, so yeah. this may be the advantage of the helmet to be tolerated for longer periods. Correct. Um, although yeah. in, in my experience, it's, it's still you, the patient at some point want, want to give up. And so this is where you need to switch to high flow and to be careful. Okay. And when to give up and when to intubate the trachea because obviously it doesn't work. Yeah, Respiratory yeah. rate plus. Yeah. So unfortunately, we don't have a, I mean, nothing really better than the clinical examination of the patient exactly. and the, 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 the signs of work of breathing, so activity of the accessory muscle, the respiratory rate can be an indicator, but it's, it's really not very uh, precise. And there is a large range of respiratory rate with, which yeah. does not tell you what the effort is. So it's very clinical work of breathing clinically. Uh, and just be remember that work of breathing uh, assessment is much more important than oxygenation. Of course, if oxygenation fail and you, it, it, it's, it's not sure. good for sure, but yeah. oxygenation can be good, but the patient's still uh, struggling and that's really the clinical assessment. So that's the, the advantage of non-invasive ventilation because monitoring the tidal volume will tell you that the patient is going to fail. After two, three, four hours, the tidal volume is at nine, ml per kilogram, that's a sign the patient is going to fail. And um, yeah, and so you would like to measure it. Can you measure it non-invasively with these uh, yeah, yeah. relatively new external systems? Yeah, in fact, you can even measure it with the uh, EIT, you know, the electrical exactly right. tomography. And there are a number of uh, smaller system which are um, based on impedance of the thorax, which measure the tidal volume externally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The only thing is that you need you need a calibration, right? They they give you yeah. an impedance signal, so you need to calibrate against a ventilator for a few minutes or yeah. or a spirometer. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much, Laurent. I think we My will uh, have to, to stop it here. But this was very instructive. Uh, as always, okay. you are very clear in your explanations. Thank so you thank so you much, very much. Louis. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Ciao. ciao. Bye.